Yay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Day two of binary exploitation. Nathan's going to be talking about some... Uh, <laughs> some binary exploitation. Pretty, yeah, binary exploitation, but some pretty tough stuff. So um, if you were not here for Mondays, and uh, also probably you want to have watched the, the reverse engineering before you come to this. So... Uh, you can stick around and you'll get something out of it. But if you want to really understand what's going on, um, I would advise going back and watching the reverse engineering and then the day one of this week on from Monday. Um, and yeah. yeah. So Sweet. go ahead, take it away. Right. Talk Day about two. part two. So as Rowan said, RE1 day one, Pwn1 one day one, those are the big uh, prerequisites for this. Um, I'll watch the chat as per usual. Say hi. Uh, you follow along Thank the you. Docker container. I've got mine running right here. <laughs> I have already cloned the repo this time, unlike last time, which is nice. You should be able nice. to clone it from that same link. Yep. So just a refresher of what tools we're using. GDB with Jeff. I tend to pronounce this G-E-F, it's actually Jeff. Uh, Python 3 with Pwn Tools, we'll be still using a ton of that today for each of the demos. I'll be writing a solve script for you. And one gadget, which we'll be using somewhat today. It's not installed on the Docker, but I'll demonstrate on my system just so you can see how that works. Uh, CheckSec, Rob Gadget, a few others. A uh, few others, a lot of times just being Pwn Tools and tools that come with it. And then Gudrun RE tools, which we won't be using today since we'll have source code, but we'll be using them a lot for Pwn challenges. So just a refresher of what we did on Monday, I guess. So first demo we had was introduction to Pwn tools. Uh, saw some solve scripts for that. Let's see if I can. Example one, solve. We just read input, we're able to parse it to get our leak out of it and could send it with the value to overflow with the simple buffer overflow of a variable. And so that had some out of bounds array indexes and uh, use it scanf with a percent %s with no size limitation. He lives and we in, talked about um... return oriented programming um, you know that house do. that's across from the honor storms, where like we across the street from the mosque. Use uh, returns. It, it's and literally short if, if you're like on the right porch right of the mosque and the honor storm are here, to, he lives in that house. Uh, set up arguments. Yeah, like and across the street. Function. In our case, it was win one and win no, two. No, it's like a Christian program. men. Then we talked about defenses. Some. Um, like but apparently ISLR they are and really position independent execution. Uh, shitty so we used a partial override <laughs> to bypass that. Example three. You can see that we've had to first deal with uh, iterator i, and then we could write the value that we wanted to to the least significant bit byte of the return address to jump to a specific and then we talked some about leaking libc and the global offset table, which we'll review a little bit today. Today, the plan will be to first, we're going to review defenses just as a refresher and to go in a little bit more detail about a couple of them. Then we're going to talk about stack canaries and ret to libc. And then we're going to have an example with some format strings using printf to exploit binaries. And then we're going to talk a little bit about heap exploitation, which is a massive topic in itself. We could spend a whole week talking about it, but we'll do a little bit. So first, just defenses. ASLR, we talked about ASLR, PI, NX to some extent yesterday. ASLR will randomize your stack locations as well as locations of loaded libraries. So every time you run the program, these addresses will be different. But the address of your program itself, example one in this case, this will be at uh, OX 400,000 
single time. And pi, position independent execution. This will randomly choose which address the program is loaded into memory at. So here you can see that this address is totally different from 400,000. And every time you run it, it will be different. Example three in our case was running with pi. Uh, what's Rowan up to? It's exciting. Um, but there's non-executable memory here. And you can see that it's marked as executable and writable if NX is disabled. If non-executable memory is enabled, then you could see it's like previous examples that we looked at their memory. So what NX does in, is it ensures that writable memory is never executable. And this protects against shell coding attacks or attacks where you can jump to uh, memory that you can write to as well. And so stuff like the stack and heap will not be executable. And then Railro. So I briefly mentioned it just in an answer to a question uh, on Monday, but I'll go in a little bit more detail about what exactly Railro is. Railro stands for relocation read only. Rowan talked about how uh, relocation happens in detail during the RE presentation. But the idea is that when you call a function, it'll look up in the PLT where printf is or whatever function you're calling. And it calls P the code in PLT, which will look up the got entry. And if it's the first time you're running it, it'll actually jump to this fix up function, which will uh, find the address of printf and load it into the got instead of where the fix up entry was. And then it will jump back to the top of the PLT entry. It will call got entry, which is now when it looks it up, it's a pointer to printf itself, and then it can execute the code in libc. Relro uh, protects against got exploits, which we did one of yesterday or Monday, where we could overwrite the got entry. So when we were able to control this address, we can make it something other than printf, like system, for example, and execute code of our desire. But Railroad fixes this by marking the got as read-only. So what that means is you call printf, and it looks it up in the got, and it's already there in the got. It's loaded at the very beginning of when the program's loaded in the memory, and then the got is marked as uh, non-writable. So it's able to look it up, and it will execute the actual printf code without uh, worrying about overwriting a got entry. And then the last protection, the last major protection that we're going to talk about is stack canaries. Sometimes you can also hear them called stack cookies. And the way that they work is a random value is inserted on the stack just before the save base pointer and instruction pointer. And then it will be checked as code is executed if when right before you return, right before leave and return are called. So I'll show that shortly in GDB. And it's 64 bits or 8 bytes long on 64 bit. Uh, machines, and it's only inserted in functions where there's a potential of an overflow happening. Since the compiler doesn't actually know, it'll be more generous, but if a function, for example, doesn't read user input, you just won't see them. And the first byte will be null, just worth noting, because we'll have to deal with that. And that makes leaks a little bit more difficult, but it also makes it slightly more predictable. So we'll see that in GDB with our first example. This example is example five. It's in the same repo as last time, so you might just be able to pull it if you already have it cloned. So we can see the code. 
It's relatively simple. There's a loop that reads input. This is actually the exact same read input function that we had last time. Yay. Thank you. Perfect. Much easier to read. So we can here see that this just reads without appending a null byte, which we used last time for our partial overwrite. It's the exact same read input function. And down here, we read our, into our buffer. And this is an overflow. And then it will print our buffer. And it'll keep doing this until I exit this call. So this seems like straightforward. Uh, we exploited something very similar to this last time. But if we run check sec on it, we can see that it actually has full protection, which we haven't had any of these examples yet, but we'll be able to see that it can still exploit these. So it will, here's the stack canary is found. That's what we're looking for here. So we'll look at this in GDB. So if we disassemble main, we can see this, when you see like this fs colon ox28 type thing, this is where the stack canary is being set up. So this grabs a random value. Uh, it's actually each program, there's only one stack canary through the entire program, but this will grab the value and it will be loaded into Rx and stored in memory at rbp minus ox8, which is right after we push uh, the stack pointer and the function was originally called, so the uh, return address. So it'll be right before those in memory. And then we can see at the end of main, right here, we're grabbing rbp minus ox8, which is the same variable. Okay. The stack address of it. And it's moved into RCX, and we check it against this fs ox28 register with the expected stack canary. And if it's correct, we just jump down here. And if it's incorrect, we call stack check fail. So we can see that, let's just run this for example, example five. We'll send a large input. I think the size was um, 32 or something like that of the buffer, so we'll send a lot of A's. And then, if you remember, this was a loop, so we actually have to call exit. And you can see the no null byte is appended, just as a side note, because it, we have, we can see the rest of our input here. And, but we get stack smashing detected. And I'll just follow the control flow in GDB, see if we can see this, copy this. So we're not finished. Um, read our input. Okay. So if we step through these instructions, we print our input. Oh, we need to send an exit. I'm just going to break right here at the end of main so that we can jump here quickly right before it's tech break at the address right where the we could see it's being checked. Continue, exit. So we could see here RBP minus OX8. If we look in memory, it's probably a bunch of A's because we just put a bunch of A's in. Yep, these are 401 is hex for A, capital A. So we can step through this. Then when we make this comparison, the stack check fails and it'll say go board. I'll show this again and show you exactly what the uh, stack canary looks like. In as well. So here it is. So it's a RBP minus eight. So we actually have to set it up first. Next. All right. RBP minus eight. Um, that doesn't seem right. 
RBP. When is when is? Oh, we need to look at the memory at RBP minus. So yeah, you got to be careful versus print or examine. Would you be okay? This is correct. So we could see it corresponds with up here, RBP minus just eight. For the just for the audience, do you mind uh, quickly re-explaining the difference between that print and that X and Y? One gave you the yes. thing you wanted and one didn't. I will. Yeah, print just prints the value. So if we print a register, for example, BP, we can see that this is the same address. It'll be up here, RBP. Examine actually examines the memory at it. So it actually does the exact same thing as print dereference RBP minus OX8. Um, we'll need to cast this too. Cast it to something. But yeah, you could see that examine makes it a lot easier, so I didn't have to type all of that out to dereference it and print it as the right size. So for examine, you can specify types and sizes. So XG is hexadecimal giant, so eight bytes long. So we'll print the whole thing. And RBP minus eight is the address we wanted to read. Is this? And so you can see that it starts with a. It's like it's at the end here because it's encoded with a little Indian, but it starts with zeros, and then eight f, two five nine one, and so forth. And that's our stack canary. And if that changes, we can actually. I'm not going to bother setting it right now, but if I were to set it in GDB to just something slightly different, it would error. But if it's not changes, program ends normally. So this is example five. Uh, continuing on from four last time, you can see as we showed, check sec shows that all protections are enabled, in particularly in particular stack canary and Pi are enabled, so we can't directly jump to an address uh, without getting a leak first. And the stack canary uh, prevents us from a simple overflow. So this example, we're going to use a ret to attack, because if you look at when we run it, example five, it actually prints an address. And I did this so that we could not have to deal with a separate exploit to get a leak, just to make it more simple to demonstrate this example. But we can see here that this prints the address of set vbuff for us. But so we're going to be using a red to libc attack, which we didn't exactly do previously. We jumped to an address in libc by overwriting the got to but we overwrite wrote like free with uh, system, but the way red libc works, it's like the win2 example from Monday, but we're calling system. So we need a pointer to bin sh, we need to set up arguments, so like a pop rdi, and then we can call the address of system. So if we remember from last time again, we can calculate offsets. Once we have one leak in libc, we can calculate any other address in libc. So I'm going to start by doing that with this example. Um, we can see it's printing set vbuff's address. Get a solve script started. Using pwn tools again, we can create a process. Example five and binary equals elf. Sample five. And if we remember, we were leaking the libc, so we can actually just get our libc to be easy to interact with. Libc equals elf. And the address of that is 
this. We can find that with LDD on the program. Sample five. This is our address of Libsy, or the path to Libsy. So now we can receive a line. This is where it printed the address of set vbuff. So And we need to convert this to an integer somehow so we can do math on it. Uh, there's an OX in front of it, so we're going to use Python to ignore that. And then we're also going to convert it to int. It's in hexadecimal, so 60. Set debuff header. I skipped the last two characters, not the first two characters. All right. So this is the address. As a decimal, it'll be easier to read if we print it as hex. Yeah, you can see here. And we can also use GDB again to um, to ensure that that is actually correct. So GDB dot attach process. And we again need to set context. Again, I'm using Tmux here just because I want to be able to copy and paste more easily. But if you were in uh, the VNC session, it's possible it would just Spin up a shell without any further issue. If not, this is just the command that is called to create a new shell by tools. So it calls like tmux flip and then gdb. Or, and that's, that's what is being called, but we need to be in tmux for this to work. And we can run it. And we can see our set vbuff adder is this. We can check to see if that's right. Set vbuff. And if we were to check, it is in fact correct. Well, that's the next example. Not the next. That's the last example. So now that we have this address, we can start calculating what the other address is. So we see here. We can just copy libc base, and then from libc base we can calculate whatever else. Libc base is set vbuff address minus libc dot symbols set vbuff, and that's how we have our libc leak. So the next step in this example is to figure out how to break it. We talk about stack canaries. Just remember, starts with a null. We want to leak it in this case. So how do we, diff there's different ways to bypass it. I'll actually talk about this after doing the demo. Right now, we're just going to leak it. So we're going to use our non-null terminated string, right all the way up to the end of it, and print it. So we can look at in GDB run oh, seven eight. If we send like our buffer size was thirty two, so if we send I don't remember how many is that is some number of A's. Similar ways, we can see that this actually overwrote um, one too many. But you see here, we can calculate the address. So at RBP minus eight, we start reading an RSP, I think, and we end in RBP minus eight. So minus RBP minus eight.
We can do some math here. This is actually backwards. It should be because the stack grows the other way. This RSP. So it's OX28. We can actually print this as a decimal so that I can understand it more easily. So 40. So we need to print 40 characters and then one more to overwrite the null byte. So 41 characters. And then we should be able to, it should just print our uh, stack canary. So p dot send line a times 41. And then we can do p dot interactive. We can continue. And we see this gross data here. So 1, 1F, one this should be our stack canary. Um, finish this. A. Uh, stack canary is, ends with 4, 1, because we overwrote the null byte. So it should be 0, but then 3, 1, 1F. One 3, 1 is actually a 1 in ASCII. So that prints as a 1. Then 1F, one B0, 1F. Uh, there's something in there between them. There's the 6B, but that probably prints as something that's not be able to read. And then R is what, 72, A7, E9. So we need, and then it keeps printing some more data after that E9, which uh, continues to go on until this null byte is found right here. Really getting in there. Okay. Um, so now we need to use Python to just extract this from the input. So we can count bytes here. There are this many bytes from the end and this many bytes from the beginning. That is. Uh, we can actually just count from the end. So this is, I think, 14, and I actually have the numbers here. So it's just counting. And receive the line, and then minus 14 to minus 7. And that should give us everything except for the null byte, because we overwrote that. We have to add it ourselves. Plus null byte, and it'll be at the beginning because that's the order it is in memory. But if you were to print it as a little Indian number, it looks like it's at the end. So this should be the Stack canary, so we'll print hex unpack 32 or 64. Create pwn tools tool to unpack it with little Indian leak. Print. And hopefully that's correct. If we align print this. Can you? All right. So this is what we're getting here. And if we go back to main, we can sure that this lines up. This dbdf. So that is the same. So now that we have the stack canary, we should just be able to cause a segmentation fault rather than a, a stack stack canary error. If we send 40 A's, our stack canary, and then something, and then call exit. So let's test that out. Payload equals payload plus equals A times 40. A leak. It's already encoded correctly because it's not it's just bytes and then we can send like 
A time A or something. We'll actually use B so we can get this different. So if we continue, we need to type exit and we still get stack smashing detected. Let's see what's going on. Um, it's because there's a so a times 40 it's our leak there might have been a let's just run it again see what happens. you know what we didn't do we didn't send our payload And then we could also send the exit while we're at it. Remember to send your payloads, guys. I've actually spent a lot of time debugging things where I didn't send the payload in the past, so be aware. So we can see here, this is a 6F. That's a segmentation fault. That's not a stack canary error. We got to the ret instruction. We see that we're trying to return to Bs, four two four two four, and RBP was set to C the Cs because it checked that first, then it popped the Cs into RBP, and now it's trying to jump the Bs. So now that we are able to control the return pointer, it's just a matter of getting a getting it to call system with the desired argument. The only address we have though is libc addresses. So we can calculate the address of system. System should be easy to find. System, we can do this the same way. Uh, libc base plus libc dot symbols system. But now we also need to set up the argument and we don't have the address of uh, the binary in memory because of because pi is enabled. Check sec. Push position independent execution. So we could do actually we could actually use the exact same approach that we used to leak the um, We can use the exact same approach that we used to leak the stack canary uh, by like writing all the way up to it. This address here, actually. So we actually did end up leaking it already. If you saw that the zero was here, binary address is here. And then once we have that address, we can use it to wrap. But I'm not gonna do that. We have libc already, so we can check libc and see if libc has any gadgets that we can use to to wrap with to pop something into RDA. We're just looking for a pop RDI in libc. So we can find what libc is. Wrap gadget, remember that's the tool that we like to use to find a gadget. Pop RDI, um, pass binary, binary. And Lipsy's big, so it's going to take a little bit of time to calculate and grep. There's a lot of pop RDIs. We just want a pop RDI red, so I could have grep for that directly, but it's here. And these are offsets in Lipsy, so we'll need to add this to Lipsy base. Should, we should be able to calculate that fairly easily with the same approach that we took last time. But, oops. What I'm going to do is use. Uh, pwn tools to find our get. So we can do libc equals rop, which is libc rop equals rop, which is awesome. So now we can just find pop, pop rdi equals libc base plus libc rop dot find gadget pop rdi Red. 
So this will just search libc for our gadget, and I could have copied that address from before. It'll probably end up with the exact same gadget. There, there might also just be multiple in libc, but pop ready a. And then we can grab the address of a um, libc, or of bin sh, sorry, libc.search bin sh. This needs to be a bytes. And we need to put a next around it because it's an iterator in Python. And we want to grab the first element in it. This actually we need to index and grab the first element in it as well. No, we don't. Find gadget will automatically. But we do need to grab its address because it returns a gadget object. If you look at the Pwn Tools docs, there'll be more details about that. But like you can find details about like its argument other useful metadata about the gadget. And this is NSH. And so this should be good in theory. You'll see soon that we have a similar issue to last time. Thanks for putting those docs in the chat. Um, you can see that we have a leak, then payload, equals pop ready i we need to pack this 64 for a 64 bit architecture it's actually wrong it'll be down here because that's where uh, rbp is so eight okay. so this is where it starts pop ready i then bin sh and then system. Then we'll send the payload, then we'll send exit. And this should work, right? But when I was trying this, it didn't end up working. See, if we continue and run, we still get a 6F. And this is actually for the exact same reason that the other challenge didn't work. Last time, we had to just drop in a random ret. So just ret to fix our offsets. This I think this is an issue with uh, Ubuntu 18.04 in particular, because on other machines that I've worked on, I haven't run into this exact same issue. So I don't know exactly why, beyond like the instruction requires alignment. But we'll throw in a ret. We'll continue. We see that it's just trying to continue, and we have a shell because it did call system. I'm going to actually step through that in GDB so that we can see it. Finish, finish, finish. So if we step through main, we're calling puts, and we have to read our payload again. We'll do this until we get exit as our input right here. So we can keep stepping through. Exits are input printed. And then we check for exit. And it is exit this time. So we get ready to return. We check the stack protector. And we could see right here it was set correctly, even though our input continues after it. And then step through step we make it to leave which will pop these a's into rbp then we get to ret which is now going to return to this address which is goes to pop rda you can see here so we'll step instruction pop rda what comes after rda the pointer to bin sh that we just searched for we can step turn see bin sh is up here in rdi and this is a random extra ret that we had to throw in to fix alignment for system. And we're in system, we can continue, and we have a sh So that is how to leak a stack canary in at least one case.
there's a bunch of different ways to leak stack canaries and uh, bypass them. So sometimes you'll see format strings, which we'll just talk about on this slide. And then we will, you could just tell the program to print like a thousand bytes or something. If it doesn't, if you like tell it what your, the length of your input is, then it tries to read that many, even though your input's not that long or something along those lines. That'll also allow you to leak the stack canary. You can out of bounds index uh, if you're trying to read like the 10,000th item in an array that's only 999 items long. And then you can find the stack canary that way. Or like we did, non null terminated string that we can continue reading afterwards. Some other approaches to bypass the stack canary brute force. So if the program restarts or forks or has a try catch that can catch a seg fault, some programs do, which is dangerous, by the way. Um, this will allow you to brute force one byte of the stack canary at a time. So like you can loop as many times as you want until it doesn't crash with a segment or with a error of stack canaries with a stack canary error. And if you get one byte, then you can do it again with the next byte and so forth until you brute force the entire stack canary. Or you could just ignore stack canaries by using something that allows you to write to an offset. So if you have an out of bounds array index, you probably don't really need to leak it, the stack canary, because you can just write past it. Same with format strings, but it depends on uh, the protections on printf. Um, and you can just write somewhere else that's not after the return pointer as well. I have the hiccups now, lovely. But here's format string. So this is our second example today, sixth example this week. Uh, what's wrong with this code? Anyone see it? It's this line here, printf input. Printf, it's not, should, the first argument to printf should never be user input. You can see here what the printf uh, format or printf uh, function declaration looks like this. So it's a format string and then variable argument. Uh, these are called variadic arguments where the number of arguments is unknown at compile time. And there's no, in C, with, there's no consistent way that's used to pass how many arguments going into printf because it, it's different each time you call it and we, you just don't know. So printf has to figure it out on its own. And the way it does that is it looks at the format string it's given. So like percent %d, it assumes that it gets another argument. So there'll be a second argument that it can read from. And you've seen, you've probably seen format, printf format strings before. There's stuff like HHD, this will be a half, half, half word, half of a half of a decimal, so this will be a single byte. Um, you can print, use like a dollar sign to print uh, the nth argument. This will print technically the fourth argument because it'll be the third argument after the format string. Um, and you can dereference something as a string. You can print it as hexadecimal. You can print you can throw in some padding and print something as a character. And the percent %n, that's a very fun format string specifier. What it does is it writes to memory. So if you have a, a variable count or something, some pointer to a variable, then if you have percent %n, it'll write the number of characters printed so far to that variable. So in this example, you print four A's and then it will write four to N, whatever is in N to the 12th, 12th argument, 13th argument. And that's super useful if the user controls this format because we can write to memory now. 
in modern uh modern the most modern protections there's uh what's it called fortify fortify source you'll see if we go to this example example six see it's compiled with fortify source zero fortify source uh in fixes some security issues with some functions uh that may involve breaking changes in some cases uh in our case that's percent n so it disables percent n if the source is fortified which is somewhat common in modern architectures it's very common because i had to actually add that flag to the compile to the compilation to disable it but we'll see percent n being used but format strings are great for leaking things even if percent n is unavailable so if you remember our calling convention, this will be still the same for variadic functions. So we can access values in RDI, RSI, RX, RCX, R8, R9, and then the stack. So if our input is on the stack, what do, you, what do we think that means? That means we have a significant advantage when we're attackers because we control both the format string and the argument, because the arguments are on the stack. I'm gonna show that right here, actually. So we're gonna look at the code, sample 6.c. So we're actually first gonna look at the, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at the very beginning first. So print input, to this random, so a random number is generated, put into this stack variable, and then we read input right here into our input of size 512 bytes, and then it prints our input just like you saw on the very on the first printf slide. So right here, input printf, no arguments. GD. But if we have like percent to show percent x it prints something we can mess with it and since uh let's see we do like percent p percent p is a good one because it prints it as a pointer based on the system that you're on so it'll be a eight byte pointer uh, in our case, if you're on a 32-bit system, it'll be four bytes. Otherwise, you might need to do like percent LX for a long instead of just the size of a regular integer. And it also like throw OX in front of it. And I like using dots when messing with format strings, trying to figure out what's going on, because it helps me separate memory that I'm leaking. So see, this, this is just memory on the system, the arguments. So this is probably the value in the first, the second argument to the function, because format string, and then next argument that we're looking at. So this will be RSI. And if we were to uh, run this in GDB, debugging symbols are compiled here so that we can step through it easily. So we can use next instead of next i. So we'll read our input. It is, we'll just have percent p dot percent p. Throw in some number of those. And then we'll step next, next. So this is our input printed. It should be, if I can scroll, can't scroll. Okay. Um, Um, sure, we'll just shrink our screen a little bit. Okay. Let me know. If... if we can run. It still seems yeah. readable to me. Okay. Input 
Et puis... Hmm. That's unfortunate. Uh, I don't know. We can disable the count. Um, next. So, what is her name? Send a percent piece. Next. And then this is our input printed. So, if our hypothesis of RSI here is correct, we can print RSI and it should be that value. And it is, in fact, the same value. And then we were trying to figure out what the stack var is. So we want to leak stack var somehow because it's it's on the stack. Our input is also on the stack and the arguments are on the stack. So we want to just figure out which argument to the function is stack var. The easy way to do that, we can print stack var. We can look up here. We see right here, this looks like our input stack var. So if we were to continue, um, let's print this as decimal. This is the value that we leaked. So we'll continue, send that input, expecting it, and we can make it through. Let's see if. So it didn't print sorry and exit. It would have print sorry and exit if we didn't input that stack var as expected. So what is a more direct way of doing that? So we can see which argument this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh argument. So we can run example six. And we can. Seven dollar signs. So this tells it seventh argument. We're going to print this as a long hexadecimal number because we need the whole thing. Because if we were to print this as just hex, it would end up printing this value, the lower values, the least significant bytes. And each it's each argument will be another eight bytes. So we just totally miss this in memory unless we print the whole thing. So be careful to use percent %p usually when you're just trying to dump all the memory printf. So we'll say this is our name, because it definitely is. Um, as well. We'll get the actual value. I'm just using Python here. P is an al alias to Python. So we can send the integer, and we are able to continue execution. So I'm going to convert this to a solve script so that we can save our progress. Which example number is seven? P dot send line. Um, this is actually probably example six. Send line. Um, what did it say? Present seven dollar sign P to get the seventh argument. Leak Steve line, and then it there's a hello in there, so we'll grab the split. Um, let's see, we're gonna actually receive until hello base, and so then this should be the start of our input. There's an OX in front of it if we have this percent %p here, so we'll need to skip that. Or we could actually use 
LX to avoid the percent piece. We don't need to get that. And then we'll just read until the A character in it because we want four bytes and that will be eight characters. Then we can print. We'll actually convert the print hex leak stack bar. And we need to actually convert this integer 16 because it's hexadecimal again. And then we can send line. leak and p dot interact to ensure that we are correct it can't be converted without a is this an explicit base oh because it's not you need to grab colon it yep so here's your stack bar and we're able to continue execution Let's see. So now we can start looking at the next step of this program. You can see we have comments here, which kind of help guide us along. So this one, we're supposed to leak an arbitrary address somehow. This means an address that we choose, not just something that's already on the stack. And then we can write to that arbitrary address somehow. So how do we get to choose the address? Remember, as we talked about, additional arguments are passed on the stack. <coughs> And our input is on the stack. So we can find where our input is stack with like three. We just have a bunch of A's. And then we can do the percent P thing again. We can also, you should also be able to just calculate this if you know where in memory it is. But I find the lazy approach tends to work just fine. So if we look here, or is our, we find 41414141, which is in fact A. So we can figure out which argument this is. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. Our input starts as the eighth argument. And you see here, these are this pattern. 2020, these are spaces. And then 2E7025, 2E7025, 2E, so forth. Those are, that's the rest of our input. Percent P dot, P dot, percent P dot, so forth. The 20s are the spaces. So we can use our input as an argument. This was the 8th, I believe. Um, yeah. It's uh, the 8th. We start at the 8th. So we can look at the solve script now and try to leak that next part or leak just see if we can get the next step starting to work so we'll set the payload percent uh we said we were the eighth eight dollar sign uh we'll just continue to use p for now to leak but remember the percent s it will dereference the argument and print it as a string. So we can just print bytes in memory if we have an address. And the other thing we need to be careful of is so if we we can do this, like so we send our A's and the start of our input is percent P line payload. So this would work, but but the problem here is if the address we were trying to leak has any null bytes, uh, printf stops at null bytes. So you it'll f gets will read null bytes for us as much as we want, but printf will only print until you get null bytes, and it won't continue printing any of our format strings and won't be very helpful. So we need to change the order of this up. We need to put this here and we need to put our address but this won't work because the offsets are different so we need to bump this up to nine 
and then ensure this is eight bytes aligned. So this should be one, two, three, four, six, seven. We need one more byte here. And then our A's should be here. And we can check and see if this is correct if this prints A's. And we see that in fact it does. And now we can use this payload to print an address. So if we change this to this NS, we're going to seg fault because we're trying to reach the address. Yeah, see, success. We're trying to print the value at that address. But we can do something like leak a libc address. Last example gave us our libc, but this time if we want to read an arbitrary address in the global offset table if you remember last week or last week monday uh, we talked about leaking and using the global offset table to um, to read and write if you have arbitrary write you can modify something in the global offset table and leak values in the global offset. so this will be set we've uh, got So this percent, we can first use percent fee to just infer that everything's correct, which is not, we need an equal here. We also need to be able to grab symbols from the binary. We need binary equal L. Six. And we need this bytes. Uh, and it prints garbage as we want. And it, you notice that it doesn't print anything after. That's because it prints until it gets a null byte. And the null byte is... In, actually, the reason we're getting this, because we're using percent %p, it should still work. Just uh, code tools is overlapped. But if we use percent %s, this, in, in both cases, it stops printing because said debuff got, has a null byte in it. But there's a little bit more confusion going on because potent tools inserting something. You see, it's interesting, we got a sorry here. I think there's probably a new line or null byte. In but that works. And something's being leaked, but it's hard to see. So we're going to just try to receive it. We can receive until we get our four spaces, which kind of nice that we have spaces here to just reference by. And then we're going to receive eight. We're actually just going to, because this should print and then uh, the start reading input. So the whole thing should be the leak that we want. Uh, it might not be correct length because it won't print null bytes. So we can do a oh wait. I was wrong about that because if we look here, it's printing our the value it said debuff got at the beginning. So it's right before these these four spaces. So we can just grab leak equals up to the last four bytes. And then we need to receive just the new lines afterwards. So I'll grab that with p.receive. And then we can um, print or what is it, set viva equals leak. But leak is uh, won't have, won't be exactly eight bytes long because null bytes at the beginning of it so we can justify it we want it to be eight bytes long and then let's justify it with with null bytes and then we can unpack 64 this print set viva pack set Uh, 
Um, we have a partial address, which is not exactly what we want. Um, I'm going to check this in GDB to make sure that everything is expected. So we're stepping through. Print the address of set BB buff. We are getting 63B69. We need to have, we need to grab the last four, last eight, the last four bytes. And we can try to continue. And we see that we do have set vbuff, but we don't actually want the last four bytes because there's two spaces in here. So we're going to take the last six. So we print set vbuff. Hopefully this is the same address. Yes, it is. So I can step through this in GDB, walk it through, get back to main. So then this is our first input that we print, and we use it to leak the stack variable. So our input is lovely. Um, but this is the seventh argument, and printed as a hex decimal log. We use Python to extract the value from there. This is the random number that's generated. And we can step through, we compare, and it is in fact the same, so that compare succeeds. Then we read input again. If we look at our input this time, it's, we're going to print this. Sizes on the, all right. So, this is our input. So these are the, um, this is yep. input. Okay. So this is nine S. And then after that, after the spaces, we have our got address of set V buff, which it's easier to see like this, 60 D E8. Um, G, so that should be correct, yep. And then we can continue and we have one more chance. This time we can use it to write to a location in memory. Writing is sometimes a pain in printf. If you think about how percent n works, it writes the number of characters written to memory. Which, that means you have to write as many characters as you want to write to memory. So, not, not easy unless you're writing very small values. However, you can use arguments like Like percent HHN dot GDB. Percent H H N. This will write a single byte to memory. And because it'll overflow if you write another two hundred and fifty six characters, uh you can have it write a single byte and then you can do that multiple times in a single input. So what I'm not going to actually walk you through the entire process of how to do that. Pwn Tools has a useful function. It's a format stir. Pwn Tools has a formastering uh, library. Let's, I might be able to. 
Mais voilà. You can see Pwn Tools format string. Uh, lots of useful like formats for payload. It will automatically calculate a payload with a certain number of writes to certain locations. Uh, I've had some issues with it and some awesome successes with it. So your mileage may vary, but I've already written up a solution to this one that will automatically generate, well, automatically will generate a payload that we need based on based on this specific challenge. So we can uh, copy it in here. What it does is it will um, calculate, <coughs> it'll get padding correct, and it will calculate the well, length of payload. There we go. We'll get the address of a one gadget in this case. I'll get into that quickly. And then it will calculate, this is a single byte that will be written to memory. So it prints this many characters. Percent C, I'm going to talk about that real quick. Sample 6, percent 10 C. So this prints something as a character. But if you see here, this is exciting. There's 10 spaces here. C is great for padding. So if you have percent 10 C, percent 100 C, percent a million C, whatever. I think this will also work with like percent D, percent 40 C. Um, I was looking for an input of a number. Yeah, see, prints an argument as decimal with some amount of padding. And this is a way to, in a short number of characters, write a lot of characters. And so we can use this to, um, for our payload with percent ends to get the correct values written to the correct spot. Um, so I'm going to start calculating addresses now. Um, libc base equals uh, set vbuff address minus libc dot symbol set vbuff. And we also need to grab libc. So c equals So libc symbol set vbuff. And we can calculate from libc base and get, we're actually gonna use a one gadget in this example. So one gadget is just, you can return to a function and it'll directly call libc. I'm gonna, one gadget, um, So one gadget will, I think it uses like some weird form of, some simple form of symbolic execution to find gadgets. So if you have like certain arguments, R10, R12 in this case, um, set to null or the value at, then you can call execv bin sh and it will just work. Uh, in our case, we have a different libc. Um, the address of libc is a So we're going to put this in Ubuntu libc. Uh, this is on my machine, not in the Docker, because I have one gadget installed here. Sorry that we couldn't have it installed in the Docker. It will be the same on every system, though. Every the every Docker will be running with the same libc. So your offsets will be the exact same as mine. And you see that this Ubuntu's Docker is actually better than on my actual systems libc in terms of constraints because there's fewer of them. So this one's RCX that's equal null. Um, there's a couple others. But 
it really depends on the system which one or the challenge which ones will work oftentimes you can just try multiple multiple of them and see what works what doesn't for this challenge i know that this one will work so i'll just use it um so one set set equals this address right here. Um, so we can grab one gadget address equals base plus gadget offset. So this is the exact same thing as finding some symbol of printf or something in libc and adding it to libc base. But we just know that our one gadget is in there. It's what we did with the ROP we're using libc last time, but using a one gadget. Or not, won't always work for you, but when they do, it's really nice. Um, let's see. So this this generator, this payload generator, generates uh, the addresses of the one gadget. So it gets one gadget address and writes that many characters, then writes to the certain index. This will be starting at um, starting at. This is actually generating a format string. I did this when I was writing byte that it wants to write to, and then we'll figure out what the start index of our input is, because it's we started at index eight. Remember up here, so this was nine because we had one more after. Eight, divide the size of the payload by eight to calculate where we're actually starting after our payload. And then we can build up the format string by using Python's format to replace this in each of the instances of this with uh, the address that we're, or with the value that we need to write, with the index that we need to write to, I'm sorry. And then we append the addresses that we want to write to to the end of that, and they should be at the correct indexes. Um, and then we can send the full payload. I'm not going to spend too long debugging this if it doesn't work for some reason. Python 3. Yeah, so this did end up working. But uh, when I was writing this challenge, I had written out that entire logic for generating the payload. I'm going to print this payload actually so you can see it. So I. So the reason that didn't work that time is probably because of a uh, new line inside the uh, address of set buff. So it's not going to work every time because of that, uh, just so you know. And here we are. You can see this is our full payload. You could build this by hand. I think it'll be the same every time, but it was easier to just write the short pipe. Uh, parsing to do it for me, but so it'll print 92 seeds. It wants to write 92 to the first address because that was uh, the bytes in our uh, in the address of what was it in of the one gadget, and then writing to the 21st argument, one byte. 21st argument is all the way over here. Um, something like this right here or something along those lines. And so that's the address that it's writing to. It writes to it and then add 164 to 92 um, to get the number of bytes written already to be the correct value. And then you can do it again and just keep doing the same thing over and over again until 
we write a bunch of individual bytes to memory and change the address of exit. I'm going to just step through it in GDB just one last time, and then we'll move on to quick overview of C. So if we get to main here, we can step through this. So we got our leak at the beginning. Here's our input that we read. We print it, and now we can check set exit. Exit's the one that we overwrote. Since we don't have an exit of got symbol, I'm going to print to instruction. to instructions at exit PLT. And so this is the address that it's reading from. So this is exit at got, so slash xg to examine memory edit. And so this is the value that we are, that we want to uh, call. So this is our one gadget. So x slash i at that address. So we can see here exactly what it does. So it calls exec be with some arguments set up. So one of these should be bin sh. So this should be a pointer to bin sh for us. And then we had to have RSP plus 70 set to the correct value so that RSI would be zero. And with RSI zero, we were able to call exec the gives us. It. All right, so that's that. Any questions on that, on format strings in general? I'm not gonna explain too many with too much detail how a percent n is used to exploit it's slowly being phased out and uh, basically to figure it out just takes a bit of experiments in tinkering with all right that was example six and now I'm going to talk briefly about heap exploitation with hopefully a relatively quick demo as well. So heap exploitation is our most common vulnerability class in modern software, um, in like the big stuff especially. So like iOS, OS operating systems, or um, Chrome browsers, um, or even just other software because of modern protections in part. and Standard buffer overflows are just are getting easier to detect and avoid. So use after free is actually the most. I think it's number one now as of a couple of years ago, probably. Used to be buffer overflows. Um, so there's common heap vulnerabilities or heap overflows. So if you allocate something in the heap with a called a malloc and you write to it, write too many bytes to it, it will uh, cause some data corruption and that can be exploited somehow. You set for free, so you free something uh, with the function call free that you had allocated with malloc, but then that object can still be used somewhere else. And so that's a very exploitable. And then double freeze, so if you free something and then you free that same thing again, then when you allocate memory, it will allow you to allocate like two overlapping chunks or cause other similar issues and a wild free. So if you call free on a pointer that was never allocated with malloc, then that can also cause issues. A lot of issues with heap. I'll give you a overview of what heap is, how heap works. So the two functions that are most commonly used to just represent heap, malloc, and free all interactions with the heap on uh, Linux uh, essentially boil down to a malloc or a free. There's other functions like calloc or realloc, realloc array or some stuff like that. But it, ultimately, they just allocate memory via a call to malloc, essentially. 
and free will free memory. So if you allocate memory as malloc, it grabs it from the operating system or somewhere. And then free will either return it to the operating system or it will put it in a free list. Free lists um, contain all your freed memory so the malloc next time can be faster and not have to grab memory from the operating system, but can just grab a chunk that you're no longer using. And it just allows for more, much more efficient uh, memory management. And there are many different heap implementations. And the only one I'm going to be worried about right now is PT malloc in Linux glibc. So this is what you see in modern Linux operating systems. Windows use, uses a different version of malloc, um, different implementation, and other operating systems, or even versions of Linux might use different uh, malloc versions. As I mentioned a little bit, uh, free add something to a list of memory allocation. That's a linked list, usually a doubly linked list. Um, but what it, the way it works is free something, adds it to the list. There's many different lists, actually, uh, depending on size or how many things have been freed. Uh, different versions of the glibc will have different types of lists, so it can get somewhat chaotic. And there are a bunch of security checks, usually, in when like freeing or allocating to try to avoid double freeze, wild freeze, use after freeze. So for example, double freeze, it'll check against uh, like the next element in the list to see if it's the same one. If so, it knows it's a double free. There's a check somewhere along those lines. Uh, checks with the size, so if the size is way too big, something's corrupted, and it might cause an issue. And it will intentionally crash the program if that happens, prevent exploitation. And keep understanding. So I'm not going to be able to go in a lot of detail, unfortunately. Source code of libc, absolutely fantastic. Um, you can see here, there's super detailed comments explaining exactly how everything works. A chunk in memory looks like this. Uh, there's the size of the previous chunk, size of the chunk in bytes. And then this is where the chunk, your memory starts. Put your data here. And then the next chunk starts. Some overlap in memory, which is kind of conven convenient because uh, the next chunk has its size right here, but that's the next chunk size for you. So there's some overlap with that, which allows for, causes some issues when trying to exploit heap but also sometimes enables exploits if you can overflow from your memory into the next chunk si size, for example, or even into the next chunk data. And then when a chunk is freed, you can see here that it changes from your memory, from your data, to a forward pointer and a back pointer to the next chunk in the list. Um, Forward pointer will point to whatever the next free chunk is. And so when you allocate a chunk, this these pointers will be deleted. You can put memory here. And um, the next uh, element in the list will then become the first one. And back pointer the previous one for different types of uh, lists. And if you're in CS here at Purdue, uh, we get to implement malloc, which is awesome to help you understand exactly how it works. It's not PT malloc, it's the exact same, but it gives you a great understanding of the concepts behind malloc, what might be exploitable or not, if you're thinking about that when you're working. So I have a quick heap example to wrap up this day with. So there's in Ubuntu 18.04, we have tcache. Tcache is basically one set of lists. Let's see if I can find it in this code. Use tcache. tcache. 
this is what a t cache this is what t yeah sure but there's multiple t cache bins uh some max size t cache is used for small sizes so like 32 bytes will be in there um maybe even a couple hundred depending on machine you're on but small chunk sizes and it's meant to be fast quick and it's new so it has fewer security checks which is why we're going to be using it and we'll, so by default when you free a on ubuntu 18.04 when you free a small uh, allocation we're going to be using 32 bytes in this example then it will be added to the tcache and let's just look at this in memory gdb G, gdb with jeff has a heap command so here's the code actually seven does so we allocate a we allocate b we free b we read into a we allocate b again we allocate c we read into c we free a we free b so we're going to be exploit exploiting this to get a shell but i'm going to first walk through what this looks like in gdb seven break main run so if we step until our first allocation so we can print a this is a heap address right here some value in the heap heap chunks is a nice command that we have in Jeff. so there's some chunks already allocated we have this top chunk um, and this chunk that was allocated near the start of the program probably um, just by libc somewhere and this is our chunk we know it's ours because it has a small size the other ones have like a large small size our chunk and we can see we also know it's ours because it has the same address but then we could step again next we now we free b so heap chunks uh, we allocated b first so we see we have two chunks now so this is b this is a and we also free b so we could do heap bin this shows us all of our heap bin t cache we like uh that's what we're looking at now so there's different indexes with different sizes this is the t cache with index one which because it has index one it has a size of lx30 different indexes are different sizes is all that means i think there's probably seven or eight of them same idea it's fast bins just t cache and t cache if i didn't mention yet is singly is a singly linked list this makes exploitation easier makes adding checks harder and it's just generally easier to understand so we see here the, there's one item in the list which is b which we had just freed so if we step next we need to read something next we can allocate if we look at now that we just allocated something heap bins we see that there's nothing in the tcache anymore cache is empty that's because malloc when we used it had uh looked in the tcache first to see if it could find any address to leak or not address to leak any memory to allocate and it allocated it and so it's no longer in the tcache so we can read into c with something then we could free a and then free b and if we look at heat bins again we see there are now two chunks because we freed two chunks so here and it points to this chunk i'm going to use this heap chunk command to give us more details heap chunk and we see here that chunk address is this has some flags has some size if we print this x slash 4 g 
we see that this is in memory. This is the address of the chunk. This is in memory. What? Go to this line. Okay. This is uh, the address that we're printing right here. And this is a freed one, so we're looking at the right one. And so it should be a forward pointer in the next chunk, and the back pointer does not exist with the T cache because it is a singly linked list. You only need forward pointers. So we see here forward pointer. And that, in fact, is pointing to this next chunk in the list. This is this address, this, this address. We can Follow that same idea, print this guy, and it's zero because it's the end of it. <clears throat> and now that we have this, we have an idea of what we might be able to do to exploit it. If we can change this forward pointer, or maybe this one, either of these forward pointers, when you allocate a chunk, you can control which address is being allocated. So if there's a free chunk that comes after a chunk that you're able to write to, you overflow into this next forward pointer, then we can uh, jump, we can allocate, then malloc will return an address that we control. So the idea in this challenge is A is allocated, then B is allocated, then B is free. So this is the situation that I was talking about where you can write A and you will overflow into the free version of B. So we write 128 bytes into B, which is enough to overflow. With our overflow, we can, um, what was it? With our overflow, we can control the value that will be allocated. Not, not here with B, because this allocates the uh, this allocates B that was just freed. But then the next pointer in B is what we overwrote. So this is where the next pointer in B was pointing to. So we can control the address of C. And then we read into C. So a soft script for this is actually super short and simple. Uh, but conceptually understanding exactly where everything is in memory. And as heap gets more complicated with like partial overwrites or uh, messing with sizes of chunks, stuff like that, it can get messed. Um, all dot pi. And I'm going to just go through this somewhat quickly for you. Um, we need to set context and terminal. And process example seven um, <clears throat> binary and libc. Seven. Okay. So first thing we needed to do was um, get the. So if we look at the code, it'll actually. When we run it, it prints the address of of the C value for us. This is the just break ASLR and make exploitation simpler. This is the address of set above again, just like the demo today. Um, so we can grab this integer set debuff. This is tends to be somewhat repetitive, but it's only a very few lines of code. I think tools needs to do it for us automatically. My but here we are. Set vbuff adder. We can calculate the libc base. And then there's this free hook thing. Free hook, which I'm gonna talk about briefly during this exploitation. It's a writable location in libc that is called every time free is called. It's a function pointer. Very convenient when exploiting heap or even just code you have an arbitrary write, but you don't have uh you only have a leak of libc and you don't have a leak of like uh your code. Which is pi is enabled or something like that. If you overwrite free hook, 
you can uh, force a certain function to be called. This works best with one gadget because you don't really have a good way of setting up arguments for it. So we're going to do a one gadget here as well. Um, I already grabbed the good offset for us. Uh, it's the same idea. It's actually one of the ones available. This was just, I think this is one where RSP. RSP plus OX40 has to be zero. Something like that. It might have been OX70. I don't really remember. But same idea. And then one gadget address equals gadget offset plus libc base. All right. So then what we needed to do was first we overflow and it was we can check the size db sample 7 run finish finish All right. so if we allocate a and b Okay, um, print A, print B. So we see that there's OX 30 bytes between them. And so we need to write 30 bytes and then OX 30 bytes, and then we can overflow. So A times OX 30 plus, this is the value that we want to write to, remember? So it will, um, It will write the uh, address to, this will be the address that free will be pointing to, the next pointer will be pointing to in the free list, and then that'll be allocated with uh, when malloc tries to allocate C. So I'm actually gonna just do this quickly for us so that, because it'll take very long otherwise. But so what, I'm subtracting eight here because we need to send the size of the chunk. Do you remember the uh, size of chunk and bytes right here? This is here. And one of the checks, checks of size is way, way, way too big. So we give it a small chunk size. We give it the same size. The size was actually OX30, if you remember when we were looking at it in GEF. So P64 OX30. And then this is the forward pointer that we want. So the forward pointer is the address of free hook. And then p.interactive. So this should, um, are we sending that? Yeah, we are, okay. All right, so we send the input and it tries to read one more input. We can read it and it seg faults. The reason it seg faults here is because we're trying to call freehook that we are overwriting. So, and we overwrote that with like ASDF, ASDF. So, gdb.attach process and then p p64 one gadget. One gadget. So we can step through this in GDB. Next, next. So this is where we free A, so heap bins. So we see nothing is in, oh, I, need, I wanted to show this. This is after reading A. So we overflowed into this, and we see that this was our original chunk. And then we over, overflew, overflowed into its forward pointer. So if we look at um, G, this guy, 
this is exactly the same thing in memory we looked at before. But this is the address that we controlled. So this is the R1 gadget. So, or this is free hook, sorry, not one gadget. So free hook is writable location memory. So we will step to the next instruction and we can print B. So this was just allocated. Eat bins, we see there's only one check now, and this is the address of free hook. So if we step to the next instruction, and then we print C, this is the address of free hook. Now we read into C. Um, next. And then we can print free hook. Instead of free hook was zeros, zeros before. Yeah, so this isn't the address. Yeah, there we go. So this is free hook, and this is the value that we had just have just written to free hook, which is our one gadget. We need instructions to see exactly down here. Yep. So that is correct, and we should be able to step to the next instruction where it ex it tries to call free, and it now executes our shell bin dash. Sweet. And so that's a quick heap example. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of like what a vulnerability might look in heap. There's a ton of different um, ton of different ways to do heap exploitation. So, for example, if you had were able to still write to B, like if this was F gets B instead of A, where B is free, it's the exact same idea. It's actually I could probably make this work. It's so this is a double free. Actually, it's probably not work because of checks, but the the idea is the same. So if you have a double free, you can, it's just the offset's different. Instead of overflowing into it, you can just write directly into base that it thinks is okay to write to, but you can still change the forward pointer. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of how the heap works, but I'm open to any questions about the entire presentation or demos um, yesterday, today, but that, that about wraps it up. And I have on the last slide, you can see the slides on the GitHub. I believe it's linked in the chat. But some quick references if you want some heap resources. If no one has any questions, then thanks for watching. And right now, Boilers is hacking away on uh, Dark CTF. So. Dark CTF, to... Nathan. That's really ironic, seeing as you are sitting in the dark. I know, but it was light outside when I started. <laughs> no, it was funny. It was very hacker of you to just like retreat into light. the darkness over the course of your presentation. My my lights on too. It's just the fans not spin. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> Is it? Am I like actually super dark, or does my screen kind of light up my face? I can I can see your lit up face with the screen. Like I was saying, it's very hacker of you. Oh, yes. Look at that light. Wow. Crazy. Good stuff. Questions? Questions? I'm gonna um this is the last this is the last really like actual training training one. Hardware is going to be um more of a survey and then pen testing is also gonna be a bit more of a survey type of um training session but we'll have um the the readme and the github for our 2020 training will be updated with a lot of resources for more practice problems uh places to look for more information etc um over the weekend so look for that yep do that all right thanks again for showing up guys Sign up for the CTF if you haven't yet. Next weekend, next Saturday. I'll drop Should the be link fun. in chat, but we're about to log off, so it won't stay there too long. It'll be there for everyone who watches on YouTube.
Perfect. Sweet. Have a good one, guys.